And can you time us? Okay. And, and we talked for 10 minutes, so I guess we're 10 minutes into this already. Um, so today, I'd like to talk about moving the right half plane full in the left half plane in order to compensate amplifiers. I'd like to talk about breaking the loop for loop gain analysis. And I'd like to talk about other ways to enhance the gain of a, an operational amplifier. <laughs> Moving a pole sounds like an easy thing to do. Just do it. <laughs> Only trouble is, there's not a hook on those poles that allow us to push them around easily. So um, we asked the question uh, or previously, why the right half plane zero limits the performance of the circuit. And what was our conclusion? Why did the, left, the right half plane zero cause problems? You lose, gain fast. You lose phase faster. You lose phase quickly. And if you look at this transfer function here, um, we saw that it, it decreased this term here. And if, you're, if your gain with feedback um, does not have a real high Q, you don't want a real high Q in your feedback amplifier, you get peaking, right? So if you don't want a real high Q, um, and if this term gets smaller, that means this term has to get bigger. Okay, so that's one intuitive way to, to look at what's going on. Um, and well, I have another question. Um, I just threw it out. Why is this not a third order system? If you look at what we started with, we had two parasitic poles. We had a, a pole here and a pole here. And then we looked at initially compensating it with putting a big capacitor from here to ground. That capacitor was in parallel with this parasitic capacitance on the first stage, so we still had two capacitors in the system. Now we put this third capacitor in. Now we have three energy storage elements. Why don't we have a third order system? When we analyzed it, we, we, we actually calculated the transfer function of this, right? Yeah. And we found it in second order. Why is it not second order? Look, we think about the dominant pole like that. That's not the reason. Good conjecture, not the reason. I didn't wave my hand and say we're not that we're going to neglect this. This is one of the few circuits we actually analyzed. Only had our two equations um, after we we got the two fourth models for the for the first stage and second stage. But we actually analyzed it, right? There was no second pole. There was no third pole there. Exactly. No, here's one from here to ground, and here's one from here to here, and here's one from here to ground. But if you say it has to be the case of wire. What? You say that it has a high frequency at CC. Yeah, but at the frequencies where it's really doing some good, it's not a wire. Is it because of the number effect and the equivalent circuit that we get when, when we look at CC? Well, good idea, but remember the Miller effect falls apart. Um, at, at at higher frequencies. If the Miller effect stayed in at high frequencies, we wouldn't have to worry about this zero appearing. It's the fact the Miller effect falls apart when we start to get near the, the unity gain frequency of the amplifier that we had that zero created. So why would we ask a question like this? I think it's always important when, when you see something, if you, you, you need to always ask yourself the question, is there anything peculiar that crops up? And, and why is that happening? Why is it second order? Do you have any idea? Is it full zero cancellation or something? In this case, the answer is no. Good guess. We would have seen it in our calculation if it would have been full zero calculation. <coughs> Francisco? Is it because of the dead network? It's the same network, so they should be the same transfer function. Um, um, the dead network, normally with three new George elements, will have three poles. It'll be third order. Okay, so what we observed was we said the number of poles in the system is equal to the number of energy storage elements minus the number of loops. What do we see here? One capacitor loop. So that capacitor loop reduces the order by one. Do we see a capacitor loop? Start at ground, in at ground. Start at ground here. Go through this capacitor, this capacitor, you're back at ground again, so that's a capacitor loop. And it, every capacitor loop reduces the order um, by one. 
Okay, so we don't have a problem with with uh, with an inconsistency here. Um, we looked at this plot um, last time. Uh, we saw that if we have an all pull amplifier, the gain would come down like this, and the phase would look like this. Then we had the right half plane zero. Um, it boosted the gain up. And boosting the gain up probably will help us uh, um, in general with phase margin or with, or, or with compensation. But unfortunately, that right half plane zero made the uh, response phase drop too fast. And the more rapidly dropping the phase tends to compromise the, the freeze response of the network. So it's this rapidly dropping phase that's caused the problem. That, that boost in, in the gain is good for us. But the, it was it was more than offset by that drop in the phase. Um, and the effects are pretty dramatic. You can see uh, um, as an example, if I put the one over beta line in right here, and I look at a situation where, well, now I've done something else. I've added the left half plane zero as well. And I assume the left half plane zero and the right half plane zero are the same. So I just move that zero from the left half, right half plane to the left half plane. Got a handle on it. So here's the, oh, the little major response. The major can't tell whether the zero is the left half plane or the right half plane. Right? Yes. Magnitude of, of, of S plus Z um, is the same whether Z is positive or negative. So magnitude response doesn't change, but the phase response for a left half plane zero and a right half plane zero are a lot different. So if I look at the phase margin, um, I look at where the magnitude of A equals 1 over beta. So for this value of 1 over beta, I project down here, here's 180 degrees, and I see that for the right half plane zero, I'm actually unstable. Not even close to being a good amplifier. And for the left half plane zero, I've got a phase margin of over 90 degrees. I've got way more compensation than I need. Wow. Yes. So I wanted to talk to Skyworks during the very fair. Yes. They asked me, why do we care about the phase margin? Why do we why would we like a high phase margin? What's the max phase margin? So why do we care about the phase margin? The main. Yeah. Well, if there's a correlation between phase margin and overshoot, or there's a correlation between phase margin and rigging, that's probably what we care about phase margin. If we have a lousy phase margin, but still have a positive phase margin, um, then we probably got an amplifier that's got undesirable characteristics. Okay. In regard to what's the maximum phase margin we can get, um, if, you, if you believe that metric, if we put another zero in, we can push it up even farther. We can get fantastic phase margins. Doesn't necessarily mean we have a fantastic amplifier, but we can get fantastic phase margins. Okay, so when I say the effects are dramatic, is that clear? Just moving that zero from the right half plane to the left half plane. Um, in fact, even if we didn't have the zero in there at all, we had a, a good phase margin, it was all whole. Then put the zero in and move it to the right half plane, it got really bad. Put the zero in and move it to the left half plane, it got really good. <coughs> of course, as you can see, it's strongly a function of beta. If I had a different value of beta, the conclusion may be entirely different. So let's try, we're going to try to do something about it. Let's get some intuitive feel for what's causing it. We can just look at the mathematics and see it's there. But if we know what's causing it, we might get some insight in what we can do about it as well to move it. Um, at low frequencies, um, V out over VD is positive uh, on this amplifier. At low frequencies, we don't see this compensation capacitor. And this is a positive input. There's one inversion here, and that goes into a uh, uh, a common source amplifier with one more inversion, so there's two inversions from here to here, and the gain is positive. Okay. And things were well behaved when we had the all pole amplifier. Um, but at high frequencies, this becomes a short circuit. 
So at high frequencies, we have an inversion from here to here, but this is into the output. So at high frequencies, the, the gain of the amplifier is negative. We have a 180 degree phase shift. So it's the fact, you, you can argue that it's the fact that that gain is forced to change from positive to negative that's causing the problem with that, with that um, compensation capacitor. We can argue that that's what's um, uh, degrading the phase margin. So here's where we started out with before. Without that, with, with a compensation capacitor from the drain of the first stage of ground, we put the compensation capacitor in um, with the Miller effect, we end up with this, this right half plane zero. So the compensation capacitor provides a feed forward path from the input to the output. What happens is at higher frequencies, we have a direct feed forward path from here to the output. We don't go through this other amplifier. So we can argue that that feed forward path is what's causing the problems. So if we could kill that feed forward path at high frequencies, maybe we could kill the problem. So we can argue that um, if there's a way to see to it that we don't have that feed forward path at high frequencies, then maybe that right half plane zero will disappear. In fact, the right half plane zero is what causes a change of sign. If you break that path, we'll cause a change of sign, and the right half plane zero is gone. So how can we break that path at high frequencies? Well, we put a resistor in series. Put a resistor in series with a capacitor. That path's broken at high frequencies. And we're still inverting. We're still non inverting at high frequencies. Make sense? So we've got a strategy. I don't like resistors if they have to get too big, but at least we have a strategy for breaking that feed forward path. Oh. Yes? If, we, if we're counting on that resistor, then don't we have to be considering the uh, input impedance we see at M5, I think? Yes. And that, so it's going to kind of make our story a little more complicated, right? No, we'll still break it. Okay. At high frequency, that's like a short circuit. Right. So there will the, there'll be no direct path from the input back to the output, from, from this output to this output. So we'll still have a net inversion from here to here. A net non-inversion, excuse me. Not a net inversion. How about the order? If we put a resistor in, what can we see about the order? Be careful. It'll be the same. Or be careful. No, there's no longer a loop, so it'll be the third order. There's no longer a loop. If there's no longer loop, we're going to see a third or system occurring. Okay? Make sense? So here I put a resistor in, RC. Um, now I make a claim that we can show that the zero can be moved to the left half plane um, if we put that in. I'm going to have to show that in a bit. Not only can we take it out of the right half plane, we're going to show we move that zero to the left half plane and we introduce another pole. <laughs> the other pole we introduce should show us the high frequencies. Um, now, putting a resistor in is a, pr is a problem. We take a resistor and make out a poly or something, and we make out a diffusion. And we're going to see the value of the resistor we pick is important. Then, as variations occur in the process, the poles are a function of GMCs or, or GM over Cs. Go back and look at our expression for our transfer function. All the coefficients were the forms GMs, GMs over Cs, right? We put a resistor in, it's going to have a, a term that's going to look like RC. Do, when processes vary, 
Do resistor changes track transconductive changes? No. They're separate process steps. One process step puts the resistors in, different process puts the diffusions in to make the devices. So they won't track each other. And that's not good. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do is we're going to show that we can realize the resistor RC by a MOS transistor operating in D triode. If we end up with a MOS transistor operating in D triode, its characteristics will track those of the transistors or the GMs of the devices. And then we have a, a, a reasonable chance that things will stay robust over process duration. Make sense? So here's the transfer function that you get um, if you put RC in. And um, I don't see the third um, pole here. Um, so I say RC has almost no effects on P1 and P2. The denominator doesn't change hardly at all. There's another pole that I haven't shown here, uh, but the denominator doesn't change hardly at all. So how do I get this expression? Is it a lot of work to go back and get this? Let's look at two strategies to get this. One strategy to get this will be to go in and put in the two port models for the first stage and second stage. Instead of just having a single capacitor, we have a capacitor resistor in that circuit. That adds one node in our analysis. That node is the node between the resistor and the capacitor in the compensation network. This is now the compensation network. Okay. If we add a node in there, we have one more equation. And, and we solved two equations, two unknowns before. Now we've got to solve three equations, three unknowns. That's a little bit tedious. But it's not too bad. That's one way to do it. Here's another way to do it. If I look at the capacitor, C sub C, um, so we're replacing a capacitor C sub C with a capacitor C sub C hat in series with a resistor R C. Right? So I'm going to replace one impedance one over S C sub C with the impedance one over S C sub C hat plus R C. Make sense? So now let me just equate these two impedances. I'm going to let 1 over S C sub C hat. C sub C equal to 1 over S C hat plus RC. And I can solve this equation for C sub C now. And stick it back into this equation right here, because C the only appears right here. Well, in the original expression. Excuse me. We'll go back one slide. I go back to this expression and replace C sub C here, and replace C sub C here by this new expression. So if I put, if I look at this expression for C sub C, C sub C will now be a function of S. So the fact that it's a function of S will make this denominator polynomial third. And if it's a function of S, um, it will, well, we'll see what it does in a bit to the numerator. Okay. 
So I'm not going to worry about that other poll right now, but I'm going to look at that numerator. And what we'll find is the numerator, if I make that substitution, will become this. And the denominator is this, approximately this, plus another term. We don't, let's not worry about the other term. So the zero is located at minus gm5 over c sub c times gm5 over gc minus 1. Now observe that if, if um, gmc and gm5 are the same, I eliminate that zero altogether. And then I get probably full zero cancellation that Tim was referring to. I don't have the whole shown in there. Um, um, if I make c sub c smaller than gm5, this term in the denominator is positive and the pole is in the right half plane. But if I make gm5 over gc less than 1, this term is negative, and this term is negative, and the, and the zero is positive. So in one case, I get a right half plane zero, another plane to get a left half plane zero, and I can move that zero around any place I want just by changing the value of RC. I can put it in the right half plane, I can put it in the left half plane, and so forth. Okay, so we almost have a handle on that, that zero. We know how to move it around with that resistor. So now we can ask the question, since we can move it any place we want, where do we want to put it? What? Yeah, we probably want to put it in the left half plane. But be careful what you ask for. Because you might ask for something you don't want. So, let's go back to our second order system. If we have a second order system with two poles, we showed that irrespective of what many of those poles were, we had to have a pole facing of, of how much? Beta A naught, right? Or, or 3 beta A naught or 2 beta, you know, somewhere between 2 and 4 beta A naught, somewhere around 3 beta A naught. We have to have a, a wide pole spacing. So what happens if we were to put the zero right here on top of that pole? We cancel that one out. But we worked hard to put that down on low frequency. We canceled that, we got rid of it. And, and, and now we might have two poles out here that are not too far apart. Horrible. Because they're not, remember we said we don't care which poles we have. The first two poles have to be widely spaced. So if we put the zero here, we'd be in worse shape. Make sense? Hmm. What about I put it on top of P2? So here's things we can do. Put it on top of P2. Now there's another pole out here someplace. That's the next pole, right? What have we done in the pole spread? Is that good or bad? It's good. So if we put it way out here, now we say we've got more pole spread than we need. If we have more pole spread than we need, what can we do? What? If your A0 is constant, your beta goes back. No. Your beta is constant, your A0. Well, we're looking at pole spread right now. It may not have anything to do with the gain. Or the DC gain. You can, you can, you can decrease the pole spread, but have the same performance. Aha! Uh -huh. We have more pole spread than we need. We can decrease the pole spread. It's hard to move this pole out here much. We had to work hard to get that pole down to low frequency. How do we get that to low frequency? Put in a big capacitor, a big compensation capacitor. A big compensation capacitor, limit our GV, cause power. Okay, so, so now if we cancel out here, the dominant pole's here. So what can we do with P1? Allow it to slide back towards the left farthest. That means that capacitor goes down, that means our inefficiency goes up. Make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So Z1 is often used to cancel P2, the second pole that we've got, and that allows us then um, to reduce the size of the compensation capacitor, move P1 out, let P1 go out a little bit farther, and essentially improve our energy efficiency. Is this a clever solution? All we did was suck a resistor in, and, and we, we get not only things better than we had before, and not only take care of the right has zero problem, we end up with better performance because we now um, get rid of that, that next high frequency pole. Analytical formulation for compensation requirements are a little bit more tedious now um, because I don't have a, an expression for that third, or that third pole. So if I want to know that the pole spread, um, I've got to worry about solving a third row polynomial to get that other pole or do a good job approximating it. Make sense? But we know what's there, and we know we can analytically handle we, we know we can handle it with computer simulation, so maybe we don't have to have an analytical expression for where that next pole was at. Pardon? We can just change those capacitors to see. Yeah, that's right. We can just start moving. We can just start moving this. That we can start moving this one out by changing C sub C until we get the performance that we're after. So let's look at the design of this circuit. Um, I, I should emphasize. We went through a systematic procedure last time for designing a, an op amp with a system set of specifications. Recall we went through the degrees of freedom and, and, and used them up one at a time to meet constraints. I, what, one thing I didn't do a very good job of last time, maybe other things as well, I didn't tell you how we came up with that sequence. Well, what, what, what I did behind the scenes was I looked at the equations to start with. And I said, well, are there any equations that are affected by only one variable? I put them at the top of the list and took care, took care of those. We had no choice on those. And when I did that, some of those variables also appeared in later equations. So once they were fixed, it allowed me then to simplify the, the remaining expression. So we would probably do the same thing um, with the structure here. Um, so we um, um, have um, 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 one, here's our design system. And we have one more variable now, that RC, um, with zero cancellation. But if we um, decide we're going to put the zero on top of the pole, uh, we still have we now have seven degrees of freedom in that design uh, with with two constraints. One constraint is the, the zero sits on top of the pole. The other constraint is the phase margin or 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 whatever other criteria you want to satisfy. So here's kind of a design flow you might follow, because we've got analytical expressions to, that we can um, use to do this design when it remains second order. We might ignore RC and design as if the right half plane zero is present. Um, then pick RC to cancel P2, and then adjust P1 to um, allow it to slide out a little ways by adjusting C sub C. So here's how we realize R sub C. We typically put in either a single uh, N channel or a single P channel transistor. And we hope it operates in the deep trial region. So what we'll do is we'll either have an N channel transistor that this voltage here is connected up to some fixed DC voltage, oftentimes B to D, or a single P channel transistor where this gate is connected to a fixed DC voltage, oftentimes VSS or ground. We want the transition to be in the trial region. If it's not in the trial region, we'll get some nonlinear high frequencies, which we don't really want. When it hurts too much, it's not what we really want. Our analysis will fall apart also if it didn't act like a resistor. However, if you look at what current is flowing through that compensation capacitor, that current is very small. If there's very little current that's flowing through that compensation capacitor, very little current flowing through that resistor, 
If there's very little current flowing through the position, the voltage drop across your position is very small, which is what you need to keep the device in travel region. Okay. Um, as we pointed out, using an actual resistor is not a good idea. Because you go back and look at the equation uh, where that zero is at, that zero won't track with temperature or process changes if it's made with an actual resistor. Um, if you go back and look at that expression, there's that zero. It's, it, and, and we have to have RCGM5 um, controlled right to put it, put it to pull on top of the zero. Make sense? Any questions so far? So what have we done? We, we've gone a long ways right now. We've we're, we, we have a handle on that on that right half plane zero, and we can move it any place we want. Is that just for this amplifier circuit? No, it applies to what? Any two-stage amplifier, right? Because even though I use the simple um, 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 transistor for the quarter circuit, for the example, I did the derivations in terms of two-port model for the first stage and second stage. So this applies to, to any of the structure we want to work with. Let's talk about some practical considerations um, associated with, with the design of two-stage amplifiers. Um, if you look at loop gain, um, we're going to see that the loop gain is affected by loading of the A and beta networks. Um, if you want to find the loop gain, you typically have to do something called break the loop to find the loop gain. Um, so let's talk about how to break the loop. But when you break the loop, the question is, will breaking the loop screw up the terminations you have on your A and your beta amplifiers? Um, once we break a loop, our Q points might shift. So we may have to address the issue of how you bias the, the broken loop. We'll also, also talk about simulation of the loop gain. Um, then we'll talk about um, open loop gain simulations by embedding the loop in a, in a closed loop, um, which, which can overcome a lot of the problems. How are we coming on time, Ben? Well, we got eight minutes left. Eight minutes, okay. So the loop gain is a critical concept for compensation of feedback amplifiers. Um, sometimes it's not obvious where the actual loop gain is at in a feedback circuit. Um, so if you look at the transfer function, T of S, it's always of the form some F1 of S, some numerator, over 1 plus A beta. For some of the standard structures, it's A over 1 plus A beta. Other structures, there might be a different function in it. We already saw that cropping up when we looked at everything between inverting and non-inverting amplifiers. What determines the poles? This denominator. This doesn't affect things at all. This denominator is what determines the poles. This denominator directly determines the characteristic equation d of s. Right? So everything about phase margin, gain margin, pole locations is determined by d of s. Everything about gain margin, phase margin, pole locations is determined by this is one that's always fixed by a beta. By definition, a beta is equal to the loop gain. Called the loop gain, if you think of a standard feedback amplifier, it's 
You go around the loop from here to here, back to here. That's the loop gain. So the loop gain, so if this is x1, this signal here is beta a times x1. So that's the, the loop gain. Okay. So we say the amplifier A could cause loading on the beta network, and the beta network could cause loading on the A amplifier. Um, and if you break the loop, so if I broke the loop here, I could calculate A, I put an input here and calculate beta, and I get the loop gain, right? But when I break the loop here, it may be the case that all of a sudden the relationship between this holding and this holding changes a lot because the beta network is no longer loading the A amplifier. And if I want to get the gain here, the beta network looks into this A amplifier. If the A amplifier is a voltage amplifier, the A amplifier doesn't have infinite input impedance, it may be the, gain, the case that the beta I calculate is affected by the A amplifier. It's not the beta that I wanted as well. So there's different ways we can break the loop, but no matter how we break the loop, we have to worry about the loading of the, uh, of the loop being correct. If you look at the errors that we can get in calculating the loop gain by not correctly breaking the loop, the errors can be really significant. So here I'm going to um, look at uh, breaking the loop at the um, output of the, the A beta amplifier. Just break the loop here. Um, and in this case, the input impedance to the A amplifier is infinite. And the output of the of the A amplifier is zero. So breaking the loop here will not cause any problems with calculating the loop gain. However, if I break the loop here and want to simulate the circuit, the, the uh, circuit for the loop gain, it may be the case the Q-point changes. So now I have to worry about getting the Q-point back in because transistors may drop out of saturation once you break the loop there. So, if this is a voltage amplifier, I might argue that the input impedance to the A amplifier should be ideally infinite. So what I'm going to do is terminate the beta network with an open circuit. And if this is a voltage amplifier, and I look back in here, its output impedance should be zero. So I'm going to break, I'm going to terminate the broken loop with a short circuit here. Wait with me. I'm going to try to terminate the, the um, input and output with their ideal impedances. But what if the amplifier is not ideal? Oh, I, sh I should point out, um, and, and I think this will this will probably give some insight in why it can be a really big deal. This two-stage op amp we're working with does it have a higher low output impedance? It has a high output impedance. Um, so if you have an amplifier, a voltage amplifier, and the output impedance is high, and you terminate that with a beta network, if you have a resistive beta network, you'll have two resistors, R1 and R2 in series here. 
Um, what are you going to do to the effective gain from the input? This was V1 here. This is AV times V1. Um, what are you going to do to the effective gain between the input and the output of the amplifier? A little or a lot? So let's do this output. Of, so if you look at the at, at the two stage amplifier that we're looking at right now, the output impedance might be in the 100K range. What if we use two 1K resistors here for a feedback network? So if, if this is 100K, and if these were um, 0.5K and 0.5K, we do that all the time with the catalog op amps, right? Then, how will this voltage here relate to this voltage here? Attenuated. Yeah, a little or a lot. By, uh, by how much? By a factor of, of 100. So our real open loop gain will be a factor of 100 less than we thought it was. You had all this work to get this high gain of the op amp, and you put in a feedback configuration like you want to use it, and your real gain, your real loop gain, is dropped by a factor of 100. Remember, we calculated the, the gain on the second stage of the amplifier, we summed the conductance on the output node. And we had a G out of a transistor looking down, and a G out looking up. No load. If you put a load on, you have a G out looking down, you have a G out looking up, and you have the conductance of your, of your resistor. We wanted those output conductance to be high to get a high gain. And you put that resistor on, and your gain tanks. Make sense? Yes? Time. Time's up. Let me... So let's break right here. That's, that's fine. Let's take a, a five minute break and then we'll try to look at the next lecture.